So today I will take advantage of this invitation to provide you with very updated figures on the data market in Europe. And uh, basically, I will tell you a bit about the highlights of what we have found in a project called the Data Market Study for the European Commission. And I will give you some forecasts and some projections so that you can relate also the work that you are doing in your project with what it is really going on in the market and what it is expected to happen in the upcoming years. Uh, as mentioned, don't hesitate to ask me any question after the presentation. So basically what you will get today is uh, where is Europe in the data economy? As mentioned, I will tell you a bit about this data market study, um, which is something that IDC started to do with the Lisbon Council for the European Commission and particularly for DigiConnect already many years ago. Many of you may have used the figures and may have used a tool called the data monitoring tool, which is an interactive tool where you can really play a lot with graphics, with pictures. You can understand what is the development of the different indicators in the different countries of the European Union. Uh, but basically, IDC was awarded with the continuation of this study. And uh, this will last from 2021 to 2023. And uh, what we have already is the figures about uh, the data economy in 2021. And I will show projections till 2030. So I hope this will be useful for you. I will also present some highlights of the study so that we know exactly. Sometimes we imagine what is the situation, but we don't have the solid figures that really allow you to confirm that that is the trend. So today you will get some highlights and then I will provide a time evolution picture with some forecasts according to possible scenarios that may happen in Europe. And then I thought it would be interesting to complement a bit uh, this uh, quantitative uh, view of the data economy in Europe with uh, some relevant data related initiatives in Europe. You've mentioned collaboration. I think it's very important to be aware of what others are doing and which of the people are working in the domain so that collaborations can be fostered and we can speed up the innovation process. Uh, unfortunately, today we will not have a lot of time, so I think that just uh, talking a bit about uh, the work that I've been doing in data, for example, in the context of the Big Data Value Association and some others may take me one hour, but uh, I will really go very briefly there and uh, basically I will provide some pointers that will allow us to talk later on after this workshop uh, if you see possibilities for collaboration. So without further delay, let me go to this data market study um, for which we have just published the first report that provides the figures from 2021 to 2023, plus some forecasts until 2030. I've included there the link where you can really access the report, which has been published by the European Commission. And just for your information, very soon, there will be a kind of data market monitoring tool like the one we had in the past, where you will really be able to use a certain genes to look for the indicators, to make comparisons, to play a bit with the graphics, with the countries. So that will be available very soon. This is the first report of the of the study that was awarded by the commission quite recently so basically you will get the figures i don't know if any of you had the opportunity to look at the report but uh, this was published at the end of february 2022 so it's quite it's quite new i would say just for you to get an idea on the way this report has been built and how the figures have been obtained basically there is a taxonomy that was already provided in the previous study and then what we do at IDC together with the Lisbon Council, which is the other collaborator in the, in the project, is uh, doing a data collection process that is repeated on an annual basis. And some of the sources of this information is this research. Uh, we also do a lot of uh, primary research at IDC based on different industries and different technologies. So we use all that for the report. And then we have uh, run surveys to data companies. And I think that for this report, we have uh, run like 1,200 surveys. So basically this means that we have reached out to many companies, to different levels of the company, from, the, from technicians to CEO levels. So basically it's quite mature data. And as mentioned, this is used by the European Commission as reference for all the policies and research programs that they build. So what is important here is that all this data is then um, feeding some quantitative models specifically to get the value of some specific indicators. And I will tell you later on about these indicators, but there you can get already an idea. We measure basically data professionals, data skills, the data skill gap, the number of companies, data companies in Europe, data users, data providers, what is the value of the data market, the data economy. So all these things are available in the report. And as mentioned, please feel free to use them also for your research to put it in context and to understand what, what are the next steps looking at further investments. And basically all these figures, 
are provided for the years that have already passed. But then when we talk about the future, we always consider three different scenarios. The challenge scenario, the baseline scenario, and the high growth scenario. And I will tell you a bit more about this. As mentioned, who is using all this? Basically, the European Commission and other policymakers, because this is really used to provide a policy insights and define future um, aspects on policy and regulation. And in fact, if uh, some of you are familiar with the Data Act that was also recently published by the European Commission, you may see that these reports are specifically mentioned for the Data Act. So we are feeding directly the policy intervention of the European Commission. So as told you, um, basically, we always play with three potential scenarios that may happen in Europe. And uh, the three of them have different characteristics. Basically, the baseline scenario for you to understand the figures that I will provide later has to do with uh, the current framework conditions. So basically, assuming that there will be a number of data providers and data users with a fruitful uh, environment where people can do business, but um, without major constraints and without major opportunities. So basically, we will go on as we are now based with, uh, with the current conditions. The high growth scenario, however, um, uh, shows a faster growth trajectory. And this is basically due to more favorable framework conditions. So this would mean that, for example, a lot of technology has been developed in the future, that we really have the regulation, the data governance framework in place so that companies feel secure and they have a trusted environment where to do data business. So basically, that's what, that would mean that the data economy is growing faster. And then the challenge scenario is just the opposite, basically looking at the fact that the framework conditions are worse and things are not growing as we expect. So basically, figures go more slowly. In general, I would ask you to, to check the baseline scenario, but you will see that you will get the figures for basically the three scenarios in all the cases. How are they defined? So basically, at IDC and Lisbon Council, we consider four types of factors in order to define these scenarios. And of course, you can get all the details in the report that I have mentioned. We use microeconomic factors. We use policy and regulatory conditions, data market dynamics, but also the mega trends affecting technology markets. That could be, for example, COVID-19, that of course has an impact. And I would say that even the war in Ukraine uh, will have even more impact because uh, that may require a lot of funds that were going to be assigned to digital transformation. Some of these funds may go now to, to support immigrants and also to support the war. So uh, these things are quite important when we look at technology and the projection in terms of investment. So all of them are taken into consideration for the definition of such scenarios. And I've included here a table that provides basically an idea of uh, what is um, included, for example, in this group of data market dynamics factors. So here we really look at the data technology supply and demand, demand dynamics. Then we look at the ecosystem, not only the technology, we look at uh, managing data ethics and AI. So basically looking more at all this uncertainty about how to do artificial intelligence and what are the risks derived from that. Of course, that has an impact on the usage of data. And then we also look at other technologies uh, and in particular, the deployment of communication technologies like 5G infrastructures, because of course they are very important when looking at uh, processing on the edge or really dealing with IoT data and things like that. So um, all these aspects have uh, really an impact on the definition of the scenario and the numbers that I will present later on. As mentioned, this uh, policy and regulation environment is also quite important. And even though today we don't have time to go through that, I really wanted to include here a list of some of the legislative uh, proposals and uh, regulations that have already been uh, launched by the European Commission. I think that in the last years, if you are working in the data economy, you've seen that it was a very active period in terms of defining all these directives. And uh, from those ones, maybe the most interesting or the most important ones to look at now are the Data Act and also the Artificial Intelligence Act that is now being discussed in the context of the European Parliament. Of course, you can imagine that all this has quite a lot of impact on the development of the data economy. And maybe we can discuss further about that later. So looking a bit at, uh, for you to understand what is the, the credibility of, of everything that we are doing, I've mentioned a number of interviews, but I wanted you to have a look at basically what is the segmentation of these surveys that are uh, really run by, by IDC in Europe and uh, to get an idea of what is basically the, the kind of companies that we are interviewing in terms of size, in terms of, uh, in terms of geographical distribution, and also in terms of industry segments. So you see that basically we really tackle a lot of companies in all these segments and all these uh, different situations. So it's a very varied 
um, landscape of interview this. Let me go now to something that is more interesting, which is basically which are the insights of what has been discovered so far and what it is being used by the European Commission to define the future research programs and also the policies. And um, again, uh, today I will be more or less brief and I will provide like very general ideas, but for sure, if you go to the report, you will get a lot of insights and much deeper information than the one that I will provide today. In any case, I think it is good to get an, an overview of what's going on in, in Europe. That was basically the title of my intervention. So the first thing is basically about uh, the, the data provider. So who is providing data in Europe? Do we really have a lot of companies that are providing data? So looking at uh, the figures that were already confirmed for 2021, basically 26% of companies claim to provide data. 9% uh, have plans to provide data. So I would say that the number is still quite low because this means that basically 65% of companies in Europe still do not provide data at all. This doesn't mean that they don't consume data, but that they don't provide data. And what it is important to see here is that there are huge differences depending, first of all, on the company size, of course, as you can imagine, and as it is logical, big companies and large companies are the ones that are providing more data. And on the right side of the slide, you see basically that those with more than 500 employees are really copying 65% of the companies providing data in Europe. And there is also a, a lot of variation depending on the industries. While companies working more on the IT, telecom and media, maybe transport and logistics are really uh, sharing data and providing data. In some other sectors, we can see that companies are lagging behind. And that is the case, for example, of agriculture construction. And I would say also public administration. And uh, you may have seen that the commission has now a lot of plans not only for a public administration to say that companies have to do X, Y, and Z, but also for them to apply these technologies and to benefit from them. So there are a lot of actions for public sector and public administration in general. And here you can see basically which are the most typical data types that are provided nowadays and data related services. So for example, uh, we can see that um, um, most of the data types provided are and database products um, are related to some specific vertical markets. I mentioned logistics before or transport. And also there are many models for access to premium data sets and sources. And then uh, around a quarter of the providers basically provide a marketing and advertising services data where we know that Europe is not doing very well in comparison to other areas of the world or most of the services relate to basically software or consulting for big data tools, which accounts for almost 25%. So this is the situation when it comes more or less to the availability of data providers in Europe and to which extent this data is shared or provided in one way or another. Here I'm not talking if they are using data platforms, data marketplaces, or just selling the data directly. So in terms of big data usage, this is also quite interesting. Basically, you see that 56% uh, of companies in Europe are already using data. So more than providing data, which is also quite logical. And on the right side, you can see basically what are the kind of um, analytic tools that uh, they are using. And uh, starting with data warehouse platforms, uh, then advanced analytics, data visualization, reporting tools, and the like. So there you can see basically the percentages claimed by companies of what they are using nowadays. These are not plans, but basically things that are being used nowadays by companies. And again, here we can see basically the same... Um, uh, the same aspects that I mentioned in the previous slide, that more traditional industries are the ones using less data, and also that smaller companies have uh, less access to technologies, to, school, to, to skills, and basically they are also the ones that, um, that are using less data. So again, this, this um, um, classification per industry and the size of the companies has an impact on, on the usage of data. So looking a bit at what are the benefits that companies get because of the usage of this data and what are the barriers that they encounter, and this is important because barriers are precisely where we have to focus our research um, work. Uh, basically, I could um, highlight that um, the major benefits of using data come precisely in relation to improving the product or the service quality and generating innovation. So this means, for example, generating new products and services. That is what it is called there also business model innovation. So basically creating a richness based on things that were not done by the company before. However, that is not the way companies are really using big data analytics. And in most cases, they are using that for cost reduction, even though it is proved 
that, as mentioned before, the, the major areas where benefits could be attained are basically product and service quality and business model innovation. Looking a bit at the barriers to data analytics adoption, we see basically three major barriers that have to do with regulatory constraints. Still, and this is something that I've been talking about since 2013, the difficulty to see the, risk, the return on investment. So when you invest in some technologies, basically to understand what will be the quantitative benefit you will get in your cases by using these technologies. And that is why many of you may have already participated in a lot of projects of the so-called lighthouses. So trying to apply big data analytics in very specific industries like agriculture, transport, logistics, health, manufacturing, and trying basically to put on the table a lot of different use cases where we really see what is the benefit of using this technology. So at this stage, we still see that there is a big percentage of companies that do not perceive very clearly the return on investment. And then uh, one of the things that um, it is now copying most of discussions nowadays, and probably all of you know this, is basically the difficulty to access data and also the fact that data resides in silos in many cases. So it's quite difficult to use uh, interoperable data or machine readable data coming from different sectors that you can use for the same application. So there are different standards and, uh, and, and it's quite difficult, in fact, to cope with many different heterogeneous data sources of information, especially when they come from different providers. And then also it is difficult to, to have them available. So it's not only the technical interoperability as such, but even the availability of those data. So those are clear problems nowadays and to a lesser extent, but still an issue is basically the availability and access to skills. This, uh, this slide um, would take me a lot of time to explain. I will not go through that, but I thought it would be useful so that you can have a look uh, add it later on after the presentation. And basically what we've done here, this comes from a project called DataBench. It's a, it's a bit older from 2019. And in fact, I was working in this project when I was still working for Atos. In that project, there were the two companies together, IDC and Atos together with some other research organizations and universities. And basically what we were doing was benchmarking big data. And so we were working with different benchmarking uh, organizations. And one of the things that we did in the project was basically analyzing a lot of use cases in a lot of different industries and try to understand where these companies take the maximum benefit. So here you see the differences between uh, the different industry segments. So while in agriculture, the benefit may be better in one specific use case, then in transport and logistics, maybe in a different one and in manufacturing, it changes also the picture. So I think that this is also quite interesting to have a look more in depth in case you are working in some specific use cases on the usage of data for these industries. Let me go now to the last, uh, I think this is the last slide on the highlights, and uh, it relates basically to skills. As mentioned, there are still difficulties to hire data professionals, and um, I wanted to make a, a concrete a note here, which is the way we define these data professionals. You will see that in the report we talk about two kinds of professionals, the data technical professionals and the data business professionals. Both profiles are now wanted. So the first one includes basically data engineers, data analysts, and data administrators, while we refer by data business professionals to data scientists and uh, business data analysts. And both of them are needed for sure. And uh, you can see there basically that um, companies have um, moderate difficulties to, to hire data professionals. And then um, it is uh, quite interesting to see that basically companies do not have the resources or the skills to start with someone and, and train that person. But basically what most companies are doing nowadays, in the future this may change, but nowadays is that they really hire experienced data professionals uh, with respect to upskilling, for example, a workforce that is already working in the company. And then also as another curious aspect is that uh, there is a, a bigger problem in finding data business professionals and data technical professionals. So basically the second ones have the experience to understand what the value could be in the context of the business processes of the company. So it's not only dealing with the technical aspects, but also understanding which data, which data sets should be used, which data sets should be combined for what exactly, because the idea is not to do things as companies do nowadays, but basically understanding how the business models, products and services can be changed precisely as a result of using all this data. So that was uh, one of the first parts of my presentation, basically providing you with the highlights. As mentioned before, one thing is that you go to buy an apartment and then it, it may be expensive or cheap, but then you, you ask, 
how much, no? So you really need to, to know the price. So what I did before was providing you with some data of what is the situation of the data economy now based on things that have already been validated. And what I will do now is um, going a bit further by, by providing uh, some projections and some forecast. And for this, I will use the structure of the indicators that appear in the report. I will not go through all of them. Uh, let me check how I'm doing with the time. Okay, not a lot. Um, so basically what you see in this slide is uh, the indicators that you can find in the report. On the left side are all the indicators that have a value for the three scenarios that I presented before um, for the EU27. So basically all of them have been provided and calculated for all the countries in Europe. In fact, the EU27, some others, and the UK. And then what you see on the right side is an lower number of indicators. And basically these are the ones that you can find if you want to compare the situation of the data economy in Europe with the situation in countries outside Europe. And this has been done specifically for Brazil, Japan, United States, and China. And today, unfortunately, I don't have time to go through that, but as you can imagine, United States is still the leader in the data economy. So when you go, if you go to the report and I invite you to do so, you will see that basically indicators are better there. China is really going forward and progressing quite a lot. And Japan is more or less as in Europe, even a bit uh, in a worse situation, I would say. And Brazil, which was one of the countries that was expected to grow more because of all the situation with COVID and uh, investments were to other places. And basically, they are really lagging behind now. And um, the process has slowed quite a lot. But I will not go into that today. We will go through the indicators, especially for, for Europe. So I go very quickly because of the time constraints. Basically, you will be able to access these slides afterwards. And what I've done for this series of slides is uh, on the first box, you will find basically the definition of what we mean by that so that there is no doubt about uh, basically what we are measuring. And then uh, the second box, which is the blue one, is uh, the main conclusion of, um, of what you can see in the figures. Then below, what I've included is uh, a sample of some of these uh, projections that I have told you. And I think it's quite interesting, even though today we cannot go in detail through that, because you can really compare things that we did in the other reports. Uh, also, you can compare the figures along the different years, and then you get them for the three scenarios, baseline, the challenge, and the high growth one. You can see the differences of having one different framework conditions. And then besides the absolute values, you can also find basically the percentages which are equivalent to the component annual growth rate of all these indicators. So looking a bit at the data professionals, and as I mentioned before here, we include both data technical professionals and data business professionals. In the report, you will also see a reference to data consumers, but these ones are not included in the measurements. The situation basically is that the EU27 will account for more than 8 million people in 2025, or close to 10 million data professionals, according to the, the normal scenario that would be the baseline forecast. And the number will rise in, in the upcoming years, but will rise more in the very beginning. And then in until 2030, it will um, go a bit more slowly. And um, still, despite the fact that the number of data professionals will be growing, there will be a limited supply with respect to the demand side. And that you can see it in this slide because this reflects basically the gap, which is the, the difference between the demand and the supply of data professionals in Europe. And uh, here you can see that despite the fact that there will be more data professionals, more supply, the demand will grow even faster. And that makes um, a lot of sense because basically with all these regulations, the Data Governance Act, Data Act, all these measures put by the Commission, all the technologies that you are also maturing thanks to your projects, uh, it is quite normal that many of these uh, companies that were not using data before will start doing that in the upcoming years. So basically the usage will grow more than the supply and, and this will make the, the skill gap still to be very relevant and to grow in the upcoming years. Looking a bit at the data companies here, what it is important is to consider that the report and the forecast include both kinds of companies, the data suppliers and the data users. And for you to have a clear idea of what we mean by that, basically the data suppliers have as main activity, the production and delivery of digital data related products, services and technologies. And as mentioned, they obviously represent the supply side of the market. While data users are the ones that generate, exploit, collect and analyze digital data and use what they learn to improve their business. So they are basically the demand side of what we call the data market. 
So how are we doing with that or what can we expect in the future, which is also important in order to, to give numbers to, to the projects and to understand basically if you want to go to market with your products or services or you want to understand what the potential impact may be of your research activities in, in the market in upcoming years. So basically you can see that there will be a growth of the number of data suppliers However, there will be even a um, higher growth of data user companies. And this has to do very much with what I mentioned before, so that the conditions will allow many companies that are not benefiting from the data economy to do so in the upcoming years. So basically, even though both kinds of companies will grow, data suppliers and data users, the growth will be more relevant in terms of data users. And again, afterwards, you can have a look at the numbers. I think that they are quite interesting. And especially they are interesting when you compare the different scenarios that I mentioned before, the challenge, the baseline, or the growth. Look, for example, yeah, just to give an example for the data user companies forecast, if you have a look at the, the baseline scenario, there may be a, an annual growth of 7.5%, uh, which is quite a lot. And then in the case of the high growth scenario, the growth could be close to 12%. While if you go to the challenge scenario, so the worst one, let's say like that, then uh, we may be talking just about 3.5% of, of growth in the number of data user companies. So <laughs> this, when you go to the figures, I mean, this has a real impact on the market. Uh, these figures are quite important to consider when looking at investments and in the companies. Then in terms of revenues, this is also a quite interesting thing. What do we refer by data companies revenues? Basically the aggregated value of all the data related products and services generated by these data suppliers. That includes the exports outside the EU. And, and the only thing that this doesn't include is basically data monetization as part of the data market. Uh, so data monetization is something that we are analyzing now, uh, a quite hot topic. And uh, basically this is not included as part of the, of the quantitative uh, as and uh, just for you to get a, a conclusion on this report, the revenues generated by data suppliers have also increased over the last years. They will still increase, but you can see that uh, not as maybe as fast as, as we may expect. But in any case, there will be a growth. And as you can see, the difference is also very big depending on the scenario where we will be in Europe in the upcoming years until 2023. Because of course, um, we may even reach a 10% growth, which is quite a lot. Something that I didn't mention before, but appears in all the tables that I have shown so far, is that you always see the scenarios. You see also the compound annual growth rate for the different periods. And then you see different rows. The first one is always referring to the EU 27, so the 27 member states. Then you see another one in the middle. And let me explain what it means. EEA comprises the countries of Norway, Liechtenstein, and Iceland and then uh, also Switzerland. And then you always see also another row for all countries. And you will see that if you sum EU27 plus the other countries, you don't get that calculation. So basically this total of all countries includes also the UK. And then uh, you can derive already from all the figures that the UK was really making um, one of the biggest contributions to the data economy in Europe. So that is why there, are, there is a big difference between the figures. And we are finishing with this now. Let me go to the data market value and the data market economy. I think this is the last one about this forecast. And the data market is basically the marketplace where digital data is exchanged as products or services. And the data economy is a wider concept. So basically it refers to the impact of, uh, of using data in, in a wider way. So it's not only like selling products or services or the benefits that companies get by using data, but also the, all the indirect impact that uh, the data economy may have, for example, in the environment. So you've seen a lot of policies now about Green Deal, things related to public administration, where maybe in some cases there is not a, a very quantifiable business impact, but there may be a social impact. So the data economy measures all that. And uh, basically looking at the numbers of the table that I've included, and here, uh, please pay attention to the fact that I've included just the table of the data market forecast. I've not included the data economy forecast because uh, it was a very big table, but you can check that in the report. Basically, and this is quite uh, relevant, we will reach like almost 64 billion euro for the European data market in the EU 27. Uh, the growth has been close to 5% in 2021. And then uh, here we mentioned some countries 
that are the ones that are contributing the most to the data economy in the EU27, France, Germany, Italy, Spain, and the Netherlands. But what we mentioned here is that we should take into account all the funds of the European Union, the so-called next generation funds, and, and you have uh, heard about that in TV. So basically a lot of these funds are going for digital transformation, many of them uh, going to, to fund uh, data related technologies and artificial intelligence. So basically these countries are also the ones that are getting more money from the European Union for these kind of things. And that is also the reason why they are also providing more contributions to the data economy as a whole. Okay, so... Yeah, I'm finalizing. Just the last part of my presentation, I go very quickly through that. So that was more the quantitative part of, of the analysis. And then I wanted to provide you with some hints. I promise to go very quickly on things that we are doing in some data-related initiatives in Europe. Probably you know about them, but in any case, just to tell you that for many years, since 2014, now we founded the Big Data Value Association, where I was Vice Secretary General and member of the Board of Directors. And basically, we have been uh, dealing with the so-called Big Data Value public-private partnerships until 2020, and since 2024, managing a portfolio of data-related projects of 50 projects, something like that. But then uh, you may know that BDVA has an agreement uh, with the Euro HPC joint undertaking, and probably you will talk about HPC today. But furthermore, we are working with other organizations in the so-called AI data and robotics partnership. I wanted to talk to you today because I'm not sure if all the attendees in the workshop know this, that um, quite recently there is uh, something called Data Spaces Business Alliance that has been set up by the Big Data Value Association, the International Data Spaces Association, the Firewall Foundation and GaiaX. I'm sure that uh, you know most of these organizations and uh, this uh, will be one of the important initiatives in the future. This picture shows a bit what is the landscape or the ecosystem of some data related initiatives. So take it into consideration also for your collaboration plan. And on the right side, you see something that is very important, not only the ones working specifically with data or data spaces, but also the initiatives that are working on the computing infrastructure. And uh, for sure the underlying infrastructure is key to the development of the data economy. So we are talking here about uh, the whole computing thing on, on age, cloud, HPC, uh, whatever computing technology you mentioned, including also quantum. So there you have the Alliance for Industrial Data Edge and Cloud. And from the industrial point of view, of course, I'm, I'm sure that many of you are working or collaborating with GaiaX. So I don't have time to go through all of this, but basically you will get the slides later. This is basically the work plan that has been defined for these data spaces, business alliance. Here you have an idea of the landscape of hubs that we have created, hubs um, meaning quite different things, going from competence center in data related topics to what we call in BDVA IS spaces, which are data driven experimentation environments. So basically infrastructures where companies can go get a contract and, and use different big data technologies, they can experiment and they can relate to other companies in a trusted environment. So I, a lot of experimentation infrastructures are available already in Europe and I really encourage you to have a look at that because we don't need to reinvent the wheel and many of these infrastructures can be used also for the purpose of research projects, but also for innovation projects that are closer to the market. In fact, many of these organisms give also money through open calls or through different um, mechanisms. Yeah, uh, yeah. 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 Very, this is very interesting. Part. I mean, there is quite yeah, many things part. to discuss about, uh, uh, about your work. I mean, and, and, and I'm very happy to uh, attending this uh, uh, presentation. Um, unfortunately, we are very tight with the timing. So, I mean, I I'm going to steal some time from the break. Uh, but I mean, if you are able to... Yeah, this is the, the last one. So yeah. basically, and I close the presentation, I just wanted to give a hint on this AI data and robotics partnership, which has started very recently. Please stay tuned. I've included the link there where you can see the strategic research innovation and deployment agenda and where many of the AI related works of the European Commission will be will be somehow framed. And that is already my last slide with my contact details. Please don't hesitate to contact me if you are interested in getting access to some of these things or you want to discuss about any of the topics that I've mentioned before. Sorry to be so long. <laughs> no, I mean, so we are very tight and there are many presentations. So I know. Thank, thank you very you. much anyhow for the presentation. I mean, it's very valuable for us.